don't like to sit in the front rows. <laughs> but it's really wonderful to see you. Um, someone taught me a, a very long time ago that uh, what, thank you. Um, now it really feels like a synagogue. When, um, what you do in life is not, a, it's not about what, what you do, it's about who you do it with and who you meet during your journey. So um, I can tell you that for me, being on the big, uh, on the big picture, um, is, is on the big screen, is, is, uh, is very, very special. Um, but mostly because I met someone very special, a new friend, uh, writer and director Joseph Cedar. So uh, for those, those of you who didn't know, uh, Joseph Cedar um, uh, was born here in uh, New York and uh, moved with his family to Israel at the age of six. Um, he's, uh, uh, you know, he studied in Hebrew University and here at NYU, and um, uh, he's a, 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 an award-winning uh, writer and director. Uh, his previous uh, movie, Footnote, was nominated for the Oscar. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's been really a really pleasure working with you, Joseph. I'm so, so grateful for you for coming to speak with uh, the, the friends from, from the Park Avenue Seneca community. Uh, we know that this is a very busy weekend for you, uh, and especially during the weekend, the opening weekend, we, we really, really appreciate it that you are here uh, uh, to speak with us. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay, about okay, the film. Let me just say, uh, I'm happy you're appreciated, but I'm, I'm more. Uh, for, 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 uh, for, I feel like I've known you a lot before we actually met. Thank you. And um, somehow this crowd is, is pretty much exactly what I had in mind when I, <laughs> when I, when I was writing the film. So it, it's nice that, that the thing you kind of fantasize about actually happens. This is actually happening, right? You're, you're all here. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, Justin, who is Norman? And, and how is he related to your life or maybe perhaps to our lives? So this, usually we have this kind of conversation after the film is over. And I, I don't want to give too much away or, or describe things that hopefully the film gradually reveals. Uh, but I'll, I'll just say that um, Norman is someone that I've known my entire life uh, intimately from two sides. Um, sometimes I feel that I'm, I'm like Norman, someone who does things or, or behaves in a way that uh, Norman does, as you'll see. And sometimes I'm someone who encounters Normans who approach me the way Norman approaches other people. And I, I don't think I've always treated the Normans um, that I've met um, very nicely. And this, this is um, when I decided that I, I needed to figure out this person, uh, because there's something about being both very proud of someone and slightly embarrassed by him um, that made me obsessed in trying to figure out how those two things can exist in one person. Uh, so I spent a few years working on that. And the result is hopefully something, I know this is true for me, uh, allows an audience to, to see the world through his eyes, which is extremely different than how the world sees him from the outside. So uh, obviously you got the best cast in the world. Um, <laughs> what, what was it like to uh, thank you. Uh, what was it like to uh, work with Richard Gere, especially as a Jewish mocker? So you know the um, after you see the film, hopefully that's less of a question. Um, there, there is something about the way Richard approached this role approach the work um, with me that, that um, helped the script become what it needed to be. Uh, I, th there might, in your question, there, there might be um, something that, that is wondering why didn't I cast someone who's closer uh, or uh, ethnically or physically to, to what uh, you'd imagine when you hear this is a story about a, a New York Jewish mock. Um, and, Part, part of what made this process so interesting was that Richard had to figure this out, this person, um, along with me, and questions that he was asking, and the need for him to feel absolutely comfortable in this role forced me to really get to the bottom of so many things that I, I don't think I otherwise would have. 
I'm speaking about uh, um, the cast, and, and, and uh, I remember our very first conversation, you made it clear to me that you really wanted to capture cantorial music in one of your uh, big films. Why? What, what, what's so attractive in that uh, music to you? So I should say that I still have that. I still have that ambition. I mean, there's a cantorial piece in this movie, a, um, a movie I made about 12 years ago called Campfire had a, had a, um, a, a cantorial concert in it. Um, and I'm hoping that one day I, I can focus an entire film on, on a character who's a cantor. Um, many of you, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> there, okay, I, I'll tell you, there's, um, the music moves me, and that's the bottom line. Um, Sometimes I, I wonder why it moves me the way it does, but the fact is that I, I have, there are certain cantorial pieces that are part of my DNA, and when, I, and when they enter my ears, um, they, they rattle my whole being, and, and that's really the reason. Uh, but aside from that, there is this contradiction, in, I think, in, in, every, in every cantor, the same contradiction that um, the jazz singer put on screen between um, someone whose job it is to mediate between a congregation and, and God, um, but he's also a performer. And those, those, two, those two functions don't always um, live with each other um, harmoniously. And I, I think that's a great, a great conflict to, to deal with. Um, and I, uh, for that reason, I like cantors. I think they're, they're, uh, they're torn by these two sides of, of their job. Um, who is Jun Miyaki, and and what it was like to work with him, especially on a on a on a piece of uh, uh, Jewish music? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I there the there's something um, in this picture that for me felt like um, what I imagined New York to be like in the 30s or or the 20s. Um, there's a vaudeville uh, element to Norman. There's a vaudeville element to the story. And, and I tried to give the whole film that kind of uh, musical texture. While we were editing, um, we worked with the tracks by Kurt Bayer from Three Penny Opera. And they, they seemed to capture the, the mood that we were looking for. Uh, part, I should say that uh, the way Ozzy um, helped me find the cantorial piece that's in the film was also with that as a reference. Let's find something that seems to, um, to come out of the streets of, of, of uh, Lower East Side, New York, uh, from the 20s and 30s, and, and, we, and Ozzy introduced me to this, this piece by the Malevsky family, uh, which somehow informed the whole musical language of the film. Anyway, so we edited with uh, Kurt Weill, and then when we had to find the composer who we worked with, um, we approached um, a, musical editor, a musical producer named Hal Wilmer, who had uh, curated a tribute to Kurt Weill a few years ago, and he told us that the, the person, the contemporary composer, closest to Kurt Weill alive is a Japanese trumpet player named Jun Miyake, who, li who, shares his, who lives in Tokyo but spends time in Paris. Um, you may know him for the music he composed for uh, Pina Bausch. Anyway, he's, he's the furthest away from the world that I thought um, this film needed, but he somehow found, in, the, in his Japanese reference world, he found a way to, to capture the soul of his character, somehow connect to um, Ozzy's cantorial piece, and, and both in sound, or texture of, that, of sound, but also in just the, the way music functions in a story. Which, it, you know, it's not, it's, it's, not a, um, it's not invisible. The music is there, it, it doesn't apologize for being part of how the story is. So I want to encourage, I think the music is fantastic, and I want to encourage all of you, I, I, I understand that the soundtrack is going to be released uh, in, in a couple of days. I encourage you to, to go and get it, because it's really, really special. Um, let me ask you something about the synagogue, Park Avenue Synagogue. How, how did you find us? Well, you may not know this, but I think you're the last conservative synagogue that has, has a congregation. By the way, for those of you who are in the audience that aren't part of this, this group that came today, you know what, just welcome. I'm, I'm happy. Um, so we, we were looking, um, the, the story has a synagogue that is falling apart, or a rabbi who needs to save the building uh, 
um, from being sold because there are no congregants, or there aren't enough congregants, or there aren't congregants who can help buy the building or, or support a community, a community. And that's where he, he hopes Norman can help him out. Uh, so physically, we were looking for a building that looks like it is falling apart. And <laughs> this is, no, 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 this is not how. This, this is not how you found us, right? This, this, is, this, is, this is to explain why we didn't shoot in Park Avenue Synagogue, because- That's a good excuse. We, um, we're too, uh, we, we're too well maintained. What we did find, and it's not hard to find, and we had a few options, but we found a building that is just perfect for the, what the story needed here on the Upper West Side. Um, it's a beautiful, a, a beautiful sanctuary that clearly needs to be renovated. Um, and uh, we, we shot, we shot, there, there, there's a smell and a flavor in that building that, that just gave the whole story its, um, it, its authenticity. Uh, when we were scouting locations in the script, you'll see there's a, Herring plays a, a, a small role in, in this movie. And my, what I was telling all the people on the crew is that every synagogue kitchen has a jar of herring somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, every synagogue we, we scouted had one. Um, anyway, I, what, what I'm saying is the building of Park Avenue Synagogue was not right for us. Um, but the sound that Ozzy, um, that Ozzy creates was extremely uh, relevant to us. So we, we took the sound of Park Avenue Synagogue and transferred it to the West Side. I also want to give a shout out to our friend uh, Marty uh, Halpinger, who, um, who told, you, told you a couple of times that you have to come visit Park Avenue Synagogue. You didn't listen for a while, but eventually you came, and the rest is history. Um, I, I will never. You know, it's got, it, it, this is this, this, this is um, a big credit for Marty because many people have tried to get me into the synagogue. So. <laughs> Always, uh, right? Multiple portals of entry. There you go. Um, so uh, I will never forget that Shabbat morning service. All right now, you eat popcorn. That's the last time you can eat popcorn while I'm singing or speaking. But um, I will never forget that Shabbat morning when I was davening Musa, and all of a sudden I see on the on the balcony of our sanctuary um, an entourage of uh, Joseph and Richard Gere and Leo Ashkenazi who starring there, and they just sit there, and I'm continuing to daven. And um, so, what, what 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 was it like to bring those people into a Shabbat service at PAS? And is it really true? So I heard that Steve Buscemi actually watched videos of Rabbi Castro in order to get into the into the character of Rabbi. So I'm, I'm wondering if Rabbi Castro has been watching Sopranos <laughs> <laughs> to get some tips on what he may need. Um, you know, um, what, what you're referring to is the, the weeks leading up to the shoot, Richard and I worked on this role for about eight months, um, finding the, the version of Norman that Richard felt comfortable doing, and, and making sure that all of us felt on solid enough ground so that we can, we can risk um, some, of, some of what this movie is doing. We're, I mean, there, there's a character here that is complicated, and everyone has to feel that we're doing something that is coming from a, a, a nuanced and, and deep understanding of who this is so that we're not caught doing something that's, um, that's not founded in, or, or rooted in something real. Part of that, um, from Richard's point of view, was just to get to know the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish world of New York. Now, anyone who lives in New York is familiar with that crowd, but there were certain pockets that I felt Richard should see, and one of them was, was uh, that, that weekend. Uh, there was a specific speaker that, that uh, came in that we spoke for the uh, UJA, the head of the UJA, and I thought that was a, that was a speech he should hear, and, and it, it was part, part, part of my satisfaction in doing research with actors is I tell them about certain phenomenons or they see, they, they read something in the script that seems really unbelievable, and then I say, here. And I, and I take them to, uh, to a certain event, and there it is. It's all, it's all real. Uh, so that's, that, that's part of what that weekend was. Um, so Joseph, you, you, you are, um, you're an Israeli with American roots. Uh, I feel like you, you understand the sensitive relationship between American Jews and Israelis. You, you live those tensions. 
So um, how, how, do, how do you see those differences between Israeli Jews and American Jews? And before we see the movie, um, anything that you want us to watch for as, as means that you chose in order to emphasize those, uh, those tensions? Look, before, uh, it's hard for me to, to put my finger on anything before the movie is screened, and I, screened, and I wouldn't want to, um, to explain anything or, or not, you know, I, whatever, whatever the, the complicated emotions that I think exist in that relationship hopefully are somewhere in this story. Um, I, all all I, I think I, I'd like to say is that it's what the movie's about. And it, it's trying to touch things that some, some of them are maybe sensitive uh, for both sides. And, and ho hopefully uh, it, it, will be, it will feel uh, interesting, real, uh, emotional to the people who, are, who have that relationship or are part of that, um, that dynamic between the, the two sides of the, of the ocean. I want to push you a little further on that. So, so the movie was opened uh, a month ago in Israel, and of course my family was there for the first day, the, the opening day, and uh, I get the phone call from my mom after the movie. Um, you can imagine, and she says, uh, this, this, this is a fantastic film, and uh, she really liked the music. She, my grandmother made comments about um, Richard Gere versus my look and Richard Gere's look. <laughs> and then my mom says, you know, I am not sure about the stereotype Jewish mocker that is presented there. Um, she basically asked me, she, she, she basically blamed me and you for being self-hating Jews. She basically asked, you know, is it good for the Jews that you uh, you kind of put that uh, stereotype on, on, on the big screen and uh, um, it isn't, isn't there, it isn't, it isn't this movie potentially going to increase anti-Semitism? Oh, this is my mother's real question. How do I shall answer this? So my mother's questions are a lot simpler. <laughs> Why didn't you invite uh, our, no. our neighbor or our, our brother? Um, so, okay, the question itself is a good question, and I'm, I'm glad it's presented. Um, I'm not self-hating. Uh, I, I don't think I have any. That's that's the truth. Uh, but there is, um, if you spend a few years uh, working on a story, um, and if in the center of this story is a Jewish character who embodies some of the, some of the qualities that may be at the root of anti-Semitism, then that question should be raised. And if, if anything, I, I think, I, I don't want to uh, step away from, from what I think uh, this film is about. I, I can say that this is true from my process. Um, I went from being pretty judgmental about Norman to um, understanding something about him and seeing the world through his eyes allowed me to, um, to be forgiving to him. And I, I, I hope that that's something that the audience will, will come out with. Um, and, and, and if anything at all, it's the opposite of, of what your mother saw. Uh, it's the anti-Semitic stereotype exists. I, no movie invented it. It's, it's been here for thousands of years. This is an attempt to, to give it some depth or, to, or maybe correct um, a reputation, a bad reputation that this character has had in so many other literary works by, by telling this story through his eyes and touching things that by the end of the movie hopefully um, generate a, a, a true identification. So Joseph, we have uh, two more minutes left. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, would you share with us, uh, what are you up to now? So after this uh, great uh, film is op op open, uh, what, uh, what are you working on now? Okay. I, don't want to, I don't want to take up any more time for, for this. There, we're going to start this movie, and whatever I'm doing next, um, hopefully will be a result of, of the experiences I've had on this, the reaction that I get to this. Each, each movie, sets the people who made the movie into a slightly new direction with new ambitions, new skills. Um, and from movie to movie, we, you know, I've, I've been trying to touch things that are challenging and, and in, some, in some way closer to, um, to my own sensibility. This is just normal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, we, 
doesn't mean they don't love you. They just came up for the sermon. <laughs> Thank you everyone and enjoy the day.